Thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Smith, and on behalf of Cumulus Networks, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar about modern data center network architecture. Presenting today will be Dinesh Dutt. Dinesh is our chief scientist here at Cumulus Networks and has been in the networking industry for the past 15 years. He's been involved in enterprise and data center networking technologies, including the design of many ASICs that powered Cisco's mega switches, such as the CAT6000 and the Nexus family of switches. He also has experience in storage networking from his days at Andiamo Systems and the design of FCOE. He is a co-author of Trill and VXLON and has filed over 40 patents. The webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes and we'll take, a short, we'll take short stops periodically to answer any questions you may have. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask Dinesh questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your questions and click send. We'll make every effort to answer your questions during the webinar. If we're unable to answer your questions during the webinar, please check our blog, cumulusnetworks.com slash blog, and we'll have all of your questions and answers posted. You can also tweet us your questions, and our Twitter handle is at Cumulus Networks. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Dinesh. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, this is a session that I have presented many times. Each time I present, uh, there's something new that I learn, and uh, in the process, uh, I hope uh, something that I'll be able to say to many of you that is new. The subject itself is kind of old, and uh, to me, I'm always surprised by how many people still find uh, many things that are uh, new to them when it comes to this particular subject. So I hope the audience uh, that is new uh, will get something out of it and the audience who is pretty aware of much of this knowledge information will also find something new in here. With that, uh, one shout out, uh, the house that Klaus built is a title that Mark Burgess of C Engine came up with when he and I were working on a blog post together. I thought it was cute and I copied it. So, Part of this presentation comes thanks to Cumulus Networks, uh, powered by the Rocket Turtle. And uh, these are the voyagers of the Rocket Turtle, whose mission is to explore the brave new world of networking and to boldly go where no network has gone before. Uh, we bring the Linux revolution to networking, and uh, the mission uh, is to be able to make network accessible, whether it be accessible to your wallet, accessible to your understanding, or accessible to your managing it. So this presentation has got two separate uh, pieces, two big pieces. One is the rise of the modern data center, and the other is what is it that the modern data center requires out of networks. Uh, please feel free to type in your questions anytime you have, uh, anytime you feel like it, and I'll try and respond to them as quickly as I can. So we all know that the winds of change are blowing through networking. I was resting in peace at Cisco when uh, those winds of change affected me as well. And uh, you see terms being thrown around, SDN, bare metal switching, commoditization of networking, DevOps, network virtualization, lots of subjects. But fueling a lot of these things is this little topology and this little architecture called class that will be the subject of much of our conversation today. And the key transformation that is happening in the networking industry is this topology making way to this topology. If you pick up, if you rip the heart out of any CCIE engineer today, you'll probably see the topology on the left engraved on his heart. Uh, the hope is that uh, maybe 15 years from now, it'll be the topology on the right. What has caused this transformation to happen? The primary reason that this transformation is happening is because a new generation of applications have come up. It started with some Google trying to say that they want to build a data center where their search engines would be able to power and work all the time without really bringing the network down. But the, in the light of that came many other applications, whether it be the Amazon's EC2 cloud, uh, AWS cloud, whether it be uh, Facebook, big data is now everywhere, and many other web 2.0 applications that people are now building public and private clouds in their data center. And it's this new generation of applications that's causing much of the turmoil. What's specific about these applications is causing the turmoil? First of all, the traffic pattern itself in the networks have changed. The first usually the traffic patterns were between client and server, where the clients were out in the world and they were communicating with a server that was on a, a particular company's website, for example. 
but now a lot of the traffic is between servers. For example, when you fire off a query, it starts a whole milieu of action between the servers that are trying to respond to that particular query search. And that is consuming more traffic than the one that your query to the server itself is generating. The next thing that has changed is the scale of the networks. There used to be, before server virtualization, tens of, th tens of thousands of networks or a thousand node network was huge. Today, the large mega scale data centers are talking about hundreds of thousands of endpoints. And server virtualization adds a further dimension to that equation by making not just a single uh, bare metal server, but to have multiple virtual machines running on those servers. So the number of endpoints is actually pretty phenomenally large. Along with that is also come the number of networks. Today, if you think about a cloud, it's not 4,000 networks, virtual networks, the way VLANs used to be. It's 16 million is the theoretically the limit, and many of them are pushing even beyond in terms of some of the new designs that are coming out. And part of this requirement means that people want agility. They want new endpoints and racks powered up in hours instead of weeks, and they want new networks spun up in seconds instead of weeks and the older networks were not functioning that way. If you want to uh, go provision a new VLAN, you got to go have a change order and there are so many people who have to look at it to make sure that your network, your addition of a new VLAN does not bring the entire network down. That was the fragility of the old networks. The other thing is people want flexibility. They want the ability to say a port is a port is a port, a subnet is a subnet is a subnet and I want that subnet wherever there's a free port available in my data center, wherever there's a free compute available in my data center. They want to be able to run applications that are disparate on the same generic infrastructure rather than dedicating different networks for different applications. The final thing that's scaling, that's powering all of this difference is these new applications have resilience. They want, the networks are fine, have fine-grained failure domains, and instead of saying that the network won't fail, the applications are saying, we will go handle the resilience ourselves. All of these are characteristics that are causing the change and the turmoil that's transforming networking as we know it today. Where does the existing topology fall short? Why, if these are the winds of change blowing, why does the existing topology not work? First of all, the existing topology was much more geared towards north-south traffic. If you think about it, the traffic came from the outside, went to these servers, and the traffic went out. There was not much communication back and forth. And if you've got just these two boxes, the amount of east-west communication you can have is fairly limited. Because of layer two, there was spanning tree, so the amount of bandwidth that was available in this network was itself limited, that the amount of east-west traffic was further constrained. So this is not ideally suited for east-west traffic. This is also a design that is heavy in the core. All the intelligence resides in these two guard boxes, the aggregation boxes, and there's very little intelligence in the access. When you're trying to build a large scale network, scale works better when you push the intelligence out to the edges, not when you try and gather them in the center. And so that's another key characteristic that this design fails at. The next thing is it's not agile. Like we talked about earlier, this is a design because it uses layer two. Uh, if fundamentally VLANs, it makes it difficult for people to be agile, to spin up networks in weeks, to throw in new racks and new compute elements very quickly. This is also an inflexible design because the subnet a subnet has to decide between these two aggregation boxes. That's about the max you can do. If you want to have the subnet reside somewhere else, you will have to do new technologies, new ideas to make it all work. And as a consequence, if also if you think about big data or if you think about a traditional enterprise applications, both of them are not served well by this particular topology. The next thing that is bad is the coarse gray failure domain. Because there are two big boxes, the redundancy you get is just dual redundancy. One network goes down, you lose 50% of your network bandwidth. A single link goes down, you lose that particular node loses 50% of, of its network bandwidth. That's too coarse grain for the likes of many people who are building these new modern data centers. They want much more fine grain failure domain. The final characteristic is unpredictable latency. If things are happening within a single layer two subnet, then things work a particular way. If it crosses, then it goes into the core, then that particular design is handled by different people sometimes, and the topology there is not exactly well-defined, and you can run into unpredictable latency issues as a consequence. 
Because of these reasons, the topology that exists today, the access aggregation core, is having is facing a lot of difficulty. Besides that, there is also the case that can be made against complexity. This particular topology relies on too many protocols, and many of these protocols are proprietary, whether it be MLAG or multi-chassis lag, VPC, for example. Two big vendors give the same technology to different names, and they are proprietary. There is no standard way to make it work. And STP has so many different variants, RSTP, PRV, PVRST, uh, MST, and each one of them have interop modes and a myriad knobs the number of BPDU filter knobs, the number of port fast and uplink fast and backbone fast and uh, you know port uh, guard and root guard knobs, there are quite a few of them. Then there are link, single link, unidirectional link detection protocols which are again, there are standard ones like bridge assurance that work with the modern spanning tree and then there are proprietary ones that exist. This list goes on. When you have to troubleshoot such a network, you have to have skills in so many different protocols. One of the key, um, how shall I say, um, drag factors or one of the key things that pulled people into building these kinds of networks was that L2 networks were somehow simple. But that has gone away. L2 networks are not as simple as they used to be in the modern data centers or even in traditional enterprise networks today. And we talked about the dual redundancy. This becomes actually a vicious cycle because of the dual redundancy and the fact that a dual redundancy causes so much of a failure domain, that is one lane going down or as a single box going down would take down 50% of the network bandwidth, people start doing all kinds of interesting things on these boxes. For example, the aggregation boxes are typically dual control planes. They have two soups. That means now I have to coordinate between the two soups. The software running on those boxes become much more complicated which leads to much more complex failure modes. And in order to avoid a single box failing, people start doing things like HA, ISSU. Over and over again, they add more and more complexity to keep a fragile network going. But the important point to understand is in the modern data center, all the modern data center network designers think failure is not an option. Failure happens. I will design around it. I will take my applications and say I will design around it. So the, all of these reasons, the case against complexity, the inability of the network to work with the traffic patterns and the requirements of the existing data center have led to a twilight in the land of the God boxes. Those aggregation boxes are, if you can call them God boxes, then it has led to the twilight in the land of the God boxes. The network's function is to serve the application needs. No matter how many people think that the network is the center of the universe, the function of the network is to allow people to communicate, is to allow applications to communicate. And when that uh, communication channel becomes inefficient, ill-adapted to fit the application needs, then it is time for a change. And that is what we are going to talk about next. What is that change? I have been known to speak very fast and very loud. Loud may not be a problem on this call, but fast may still be. So I'm happy to pause at this minute and take any questions that people might have. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually coming in. Okay. Um, what is the max amount of ECMP link supported? Maximum. So we will talk about that in a second when we get into the networks uh, 2.0. But if you're thinking about it, the question is in the context of the old world, then the number of ECMP is actually limited to the number of LACPs and the two redundant supervisors, and that's usually just like eight. But the point is not that you have whether ECMP across eight, the problem is redundancy as well. Perfect. And next question, hi Dinesh, what are the major steps to get rid of the classical L2 stretch across data center and co-location data center while massive building VM and L2 cluster server systems? Well, that's what I hope I'll be talking about in the next uh, few minutes. Okay, and uh, another question. Uh, agree with SPURT and L2 protocols is not. We are moving something similar with leaf spine L3 as well like SDN MPTCP. Okay, multi-path uh, TCP. MPTCP is multi-path TCP. And then, um, okay. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. And then we'll take the rest at the end. Okay. So moving on, what is the shape of the new network? 
So it's interesting that today people are talking about when there are networks that are becoming more and more, uh, people understand that scale distributed networks, networks that do not have a central point of failure is what makes the internet so, work so well and is what is an important factor to be achieved that today people are running back into centralized controllers in the hope that that will somehow give them the leverage and the ability to understand and manage networks better. But one idea that is actually pretty useful, but that is a idea that originated back in 1953 is this topology called class topology or some people mistakenly call it the fat tree topology or the spine leaf topology. It was invented by a telephony engineer called Charles Kloss and the problem he was trying to solve was how to build ever larger telephony networks without building ever larger telephony switches. He wanted to be able to assemble a large network out of small building blocks. And that's a similar problem that modern data centers uh, have decided is something that they want to solve. They want to use simple composable building blocks to build large networks out of this. It's interesting that, you know, back in 1953, today, you know, you have a yeah, hotshot company, you have their pictures splashed everywhere, and you can look at the social media and find out what they look like, and even what their girlfriends look like, and what they ate for dinner last night. But Charles Kloss, I have been unable to find a picture of him anywhere. I don't have a face to put to that name. So if any of you have a picture of him, I would much appreciate you sending me a link. I'd be happy to have that picture. I think what he has done is uh, very interesting technology, something that's applicable 60 years down the road as well. And so, so what are the characteristics of the class network? The characteristics of the class network are that it is well matched for east-west traffic pattern. As you can see in this topology, the links are all multiple connected. The first thing that you observe in this topology compared to the previous topology is the fact that there is no dual redundancy. You see that there are four in this picture, but people build with 16 as well. I know people who are built to 24 and 32 of these spines as well. And this is a very scalable network topology. And I'll talk about how it is scalable in a second. The one thing that it relies on is ECMP, which is equal cost multipathing. What that means is any one of these servers to get to any one of the other servers can use any one of these paths to get to them. And the way it uses them is it uses what is called multipathing, which is a pretty standard technology that has been used in IP networking for a long, long time. Something that, for example, layer two does not have today. Technologies such as Trill or Fabric Path, which I worked on and jointly came up with, are ideas that attempt to make IP work at layer two. But there's no reason to duplicate the whole new thing in layer two. You can just have use IP, which is a mature and well-understood technology with protocols and ideas that and tools, more importantly, and debugging and troubleshooting knowledge and experience that already exist in the world. But this reliance on ECMP and the ability to use all the links going from any one of these boxes to any one of the other boxes is an important characteristic of this network. The very aspect of ECMP and the fact that there is no dual redundancy leads to a fine-grained failure domain support. And we'll talk about each one of these in detail uh, in the next few slides. So any questions you have, uh, please uh, hold on that, and I hope I'll be able to address them in the next few slides. This network also has predictable latency, and we'll talk about that. And coupled with network virtualization, this can serve as a basis for agility and flexibility. So someone was asking, how do I go about building a network so that I can have my L2 scale anywhere in the data center? So I could have a subnet that is present at one end of the data center also be present at another end of the data center without requiring me to do either layer two or anything very complicated that doesn't work. And one answer is network virtualization running on top of a fabric that is built on class. And for those of you who are been in the field, who know the industry well, you know that this is not something that is specific to cumulus networks. The class topology has been agreed is a solution moving forward by anybody. You look at NCMA or Cisco, they have the same topology. You look at QFabric from Juniper, they have the same topology. You look at Arista, they say, hey, we've got something called a spline, which is a spine and a leaf combined into a single box and they talk about class networks. You pick any network operators such as Amazon, Microsoft, Google, all of them, 
built using these topologies based on class. So the bottom line is the, this is not some arcane thing that is being pushed for by Cumulus or anybody else. Those of you who are in the uh, field know that this is uh, something that's actually pretty well established and there's just a lot of articles about it. So why do I call that this network is scalable? Let's take a simple example. If you look at this topology, you say, well, that's not too many boxes. Are you talking about hundreds of thousands of boxes? How do I build hundreds of thousands of boxes with something like this? Well, the nice part about it is like a Lego block. You can take multiple one of these and slap them together. And now you built a larger network. Oh, how much larger of a network can you build with this? And how much can you scale? Let's look at that in the next few slides. But before we pro proceed, I wanted to also put in a few terminologies. Each one of these is called a pod or a cluster by most people. Some people call it a brick, but this is usually referred to as a cluster or a pod. Similarly, you see that there are this particular picture has two clusters or pod. Interconnecting all these clusters or pod is an intercluster spine network or an interpod spine network. So how big can they be? Let's, the interesting part about uh, class networks is it is very mathematical. If you consider that there are these top of rack switches, these mid tier spine switches, and the top tier spine sp switches are a spine within a pod and a spine across pods, let's consider that these switches have M ports, N ports, and O ports, meaning say, for example, this switch has 32 ports, 64 ports, this switch has 64 ports, and this switch has 64 ports. If those are the numbers, the total number of servers that can be attached to a two-tier fabric like this is M into N by two. And the total number of servers that can be attached to a three-tier fabric like this is M into N into O by four. And you say, that's great, Dinesh. I helped my daughter with math last night. Uh, can you tell me something that I can actually use? So if you look at the port math from a different perspective, you can say that the number of servers in a rack, which is M, is what you would consider, plus the uplinks is what you would consider as the M part here. And the number of racks you want in a pod is what governs the port count of a spine switch, a pod spine switch. And the number of pods you have within your data center is what governs the number of ports you have on an intercluster spine switch. Once you decide how many ports each one of them have, how many of these spines do you have, and what interswitch links do you use is a function of your failure domain, is a function of the cost, and the cabling simplification. And we'll address each one of them in, a, in the next few slides. Doing something that's a little more concrete, if you look at a Trident Plus 64 port 10 gigi switch, something that's been out in the market for a very long time, a two-tier box can stick in, theoretically, up to 2,000 servers. And a three-tier can take it up to 64,000 servers. That's pretty big, that you can have a single network with no change go from 2,000 to 64,000. If you look at a more modern chipset, such as Trident 2 from Broadcom, your box is available with 96 port 10 gig. E. Those boxes, you can take a two-tier network to 4,600 ports, or to 216K ports total with a three tier. Now you're talking mega scale, right? You have a network that scales from something as small as 2K all the way up to 216K. And if you want to look at more pragmatic numbers, for example, people say, well, I'm not going to be able to stick 48 servers in a rack. Most people, because of power constraints in a rack, stick about 40 servers per rack or even less. If you look at that and you look at the standard box that are available from the ODM and many other traditional networking vendors, they are 48 10 gigi ports and four 40 gigi ports. With an over subscription of 2.5 with four spines, you can go up to 1920 ports, which is pretty close to 2K. Or you can go up to 60K, which is again pretty close to 64K. With a Trident 2, you stay at 1920 because the number of servers are what is determining how many you can build out to. But in a three tier, you can go all the way up to 184K. Actually, this number is wrong now that I think about it because I have 9, 48 ports of 10 gig e, uh, nine, I can break out these 640 now. I think this number is fine, 1920. So 
with that, there are more topology variations. Uh, but before I proceed, any questions associated with the topology math or any of this? Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in. Do okay. You want to take some time and answer them? Sure. Great. Um, do you see all size networks moving to networks 2.0 in the future or only large sized? I think that's a classic function of time, right? When the world began, say for example, when you go back in time and you think about 1998 or 2000 actually, uh, Google said, went to, wanted to build this data center and they said like, oh, you know, I want my servers to be reliable. I want my search applications to run well. And yet people who said, hey, I've got a non-stop Unix kernel. You got to take my non-stop Unix kernel and run with it. And they said, cool, uh, what does your non-stop Unix kernel do? Hey, your applications will never stop because the non-stop Unix kernel will keep running. It'll deal with failures. It's not like this other thing that's coming out there called Linux that is pretty you know, new and it's written by a bunch of college students. There's not even a real company funding it. And uh, compared to that, you know, we are really good. Does your uh, non-stop Unix kernel deal with fan failures? No, of course not. How can we deal with fan failures? It's an operating system. What about disk failures? No. And this went on. And so then how much does your box really cost? Your non-stop Unix kernel cost? Oh, maybe 20x. Let's assume the Linux is free. Let's just say it's 20 times more. So Google said, if I just put 10 boxes and build my application so that those 10 boxes, if one of them fails, I lose one tenth of my bandwidth. Now I have a network that's powered by something like Linux that the community is behind, and I get the advantage that at one, half the price, I have better redundancy and redundancy that deals with fan failures, disk failures, link failures, cable failures, and I'll just make my application be resilient as well. Back then, Solaris, SGI, HPUX, all of them were mega million dollar businesses. Today, they no longer exist. So a very long answer to your question, the mega data centers are the ones that feel the pain and they have moved there already. The others are slowly moving there. The technologies are coming, some of the applications prevented, some of the technology with respect to network virtualization may not be as cost effective for some people, but I think in time you will see that most everyone will move to this particular topology. And again, I want to be very clear, I'm talking about data centers, I'm not talking about service provider networks, I'm not talking about wireless networks and other kinds of networks. I'm very focused on data center as far as this discussion is concerned. Great. And what is the future access switches with class? Oh. The, or sorry, the future of access switches with class. So to me, an access switch comes with a particular property, which is essentially today, if you think of an access aggregation core, the access switch is typically considered L2. Today, that, there used to be a time, and in fact, it's surprising to me the other day, I was looking for something and people were saying like, oh, you should use layer two over layer three. You should not use IP because IP is software switched and the latency and the performance is actually pretty poor compared to layer two, which is switched in hardware. That has not been true since 1998 or even longer than that. So when you think about an access switch, which is purely layer two, I see those going away. I think layer three based access switches will be coming in future because of again the scale and access switches by themselves are no different from a leaf in a way and the intelligence that is being pushed to them is going to get pushed out also to hypervisors because the true power is because they are the first touch functions. But if you're running bare metal servers, then the access switches will just become a little more intelligent uh, rather than being dumb. Great. And does your technology also make sense for traditional enterprise applications? So that's a question I have been asked many times in the past. Uh, it's been asked when I was in my previous life at Cisco. I'd like to think so, but I also want to be a little careful because I'm not exactly uh, confident with all the modern applications that run inside an enterprise. For example, if you think about uh, this particular topology, this particular topology might work fine, but typically in the enterprise, you've got things like CapWap, which are required for wireless and wired networks. They work fine, but maybe that's uh, that requires some additional functionality that I'm not aware of. So a highly theoretical answer might be yes, but I want to be more precise and say, I don't know enough to be able to answer that confidently. 
And another question, um, and then we'll go on after this. Um, do you believe that the large technology-driven cost reductions in switching will lead to people designing less contention in networks, possibly one-to-one -one non blocking from the server up to the inner spine? Absolutely. That is a great question, and I think that is what you're going to see. It's going to be driven by multiple factors. One factor is the point that you made, made which is it's the x86ization of the networking ASICs, right? Today, you have Broadcom that's coming out with these ASICs at a pretty rapid clip, and now if you look around, you see so many other companies coming out with similar ASICs that are trying to match or compete with Broadcom. What this means is this becomes the x86 of the networking market. That means there is a broad adoption of this. If you think about last year, even Cisco and Arista, two big vendors, uh, their major announcement was around Merchant Silicon, such as the, the Broadcom ASIC that their products were based on. Arista, of course, its entire business is based on Merchant Silicon. But Cisco even had to, which prides itself on building in-house ASICs and custom ASICs, uh, is right now generating product after product, which is based on these x86-like uh, network processors. But the other aspect of it is, because this is now becoming a more commoditized market, even things such as cabling come down in cost. So the reasons why people did not buy 10 giggy boxes or build non-blocking class architectures was cost driven many times. If you think about cables, today the cables, if you go buy from a traditional networking vendor, can cost you $1,000 when the same cable is available for like $100 outside. And there is no difference in quality. It's just that this is a mechanism for vendor lock-in. So all of these factors add to being able to making the network a lot more faster and a lot more affordable. So I'll carry on with my slides uh, because I'm already approaching the 30 minute mark. Uh, so as we talked about, the topology variations are not just a simple two tier or a simple three tier. I have seen people build all kinds of interesting. So this is a classical three tier network that we talked about. People also build a three tier network that looks like this. And in this, you see that these, this is a two-tier network here, and this is a two-tier network here, and there's a two-tier network here. This is four tiers, but the way these are connected is very different. What people have done is this little box around each one can be considered like a virtual chassis. And what people do is they run these networks completely independent of one another, that if any failure happens in this particular network, these boxes will keep going because they are connected to other such virtual chassis. So you can build in failure domain and you can introduce failure domain in many interesting ways in these networks. And this is another classical four tier uh, topology that I have seen in uh, mega data centers. So there are many variations to this topology, even though the topology looks like a simple leaf spine. So people like to call these spine leaf or leaf spine networks, but it's a lot more than leaf spine. And uh, this network is very, very scalable. The leaf spine network is just a simple Lego building block. Let's talk about fine grain failure domain now. If you think about it, if a link goes down, I only lose 25% of my network bandwidth. That particular node here lost only 25% of its network bandwidth because it has three other links going to three other spine switches compared to 50% before. If an entire spine switch dies away, all of these boxes lose only 25% of their network bandwidth. And I have seen large data centers build eight-way and 16-way ECMPs, which means that their network failure domain is, can be much more constrained. But four-way ECMP is pretty common in all the data centers I've seen, and many of the even, you know, Fortune 500 companies are now doing four-way ECMP boxes. So you're already bettered your failure domain. But the important point, again, is this is a network that scales. You want to just build a two-way redundancy, dual redundancy, you can do it with this network. Nothing prevents you from doing it. You want to go to a 16-way ECMP, knock yourselves out. The same network works. And that is the beauty of this network. And that is the beauty of IP and a layer 3 fabric. A spanning tree and a layer 2-based fabric does not allow for that. You cannot have a spanning tree. Even if you think about MLAG, the solutions that are all shipped, use only a dual redundancy. It's not a network that can scale to any redundancy you want. And that's the inflexibility of that network design compared to a network design like this. And also, there is a case for simplicity. We talked about the number of protocols that such a network would have. In this network, you can reduce it to just a single IP routing protocol. And 
and you don't need FHRP, you don't need HSRP, VRRP, GLD, PP, any of them. You don't need STP and its myriad L2 variants. You can run with OSPF, you can run with BGP. They are standard protocols. Uh, certain knobs are available with certain vendors and not others, but pretty much all the knobs you can work within the data center. The fabric itself is fairly simple. And what it's responsible for is for allowing applications to communicate with each other very effectively without providing hotspots that you can build with very simple uh, routing protocols a very complex topology. So the first thing you get with that is the ability to troubleshoot very effectively because now you're dealing with one or two protocols. You're not dealing with 15 of them. So when something goes wrong, it's pretty easy for you to know what is going wrong. The next aspect of this is people say, oh, this is all very nice, leaf and spine, but Dinesh, don't you think a spine needs to be a chassis? Does it not need to be this big box that you were uh, saying is uh, actually the twilight of the guard box? Not really. What, if you think about it, I can build a 64,000 cluster using just 64 port switches. Just pause for a second and think about it. Or I can build a 2,000 node cluster. 2,000 nodes is already large for many people. 64,000, you're already talking about approaching pretty, pretty large data centers. And for any one of all of them have been built with 64 port boxes. Think again about what happened in the server market. When I had HP, I had Sun, I had SGI, I couldn't take their terminals and their monitors and their keyboards and work with it. So if the Sun keyboard failed, I had to stick a Sun keyboard in. If an SGI monitor failed, I had to have an SGI monitor, which meant that my inventory as a company to keep running was pretty complicated. I had to stock N variations of N things. I've got a Nexus 7000 and Arista and various other things. How many different line cards do I have to stock? With a simple one RU box, you have one kind to stock. You think that your supplier, like say, uh, a name a particular rhodium supplier is going to be vulnerable and you want to have two of them, that's fine. They run on the same, they use the same mechanisms. So all that you need to now have is normalize on the operating system and you have a very simple inventory model. This simple inventory model also leads to simplified management. Uh, given the time constraints, I will not be able to go into the management uh, of this class fabric. Uh, we will talk about how the class, the house that the class built, but inhabiting the house that class built will be a subject of the next present webinar. And I'll get into the detail there. But again, a simple box like this leads to simplified management. You also have reduced latency. You think about a big mega chassis. What's the latency of those line cards and how much, how fast are they? Compare that to something like a one RU box or a network build out of one RU boxes and you get pretty comparable performance, if not better and reduce latency. Also, the other aspect is these simple 1RU boxes mean simple failures. Today, if you look at a chassis, you've sold your first one to be able to buy one of those boxes. If something goes wrong with it, you're not going to just put a new box in there and start working with it while you go debug this on the side. You need to, you will sit down and say, is the line card not fitting? Is the back plane having a problem with this line card? Is there a connector problem? Is it a CPU that's on the line card that has failed? The number of possible failures are complicated. And what that means is when you have to troubleshoot the network, you will take time. And while you're taking this time, your network is limping. What you want to be able to do is put in a new box and keep going and debug this box on the side. Because these one RU boxes are cost effective, and affordable, it allows you to be able to do that. Again, think about this, because they're simple one are you boxes and you've structured yourself into thinking, I'll have enough of them that I won't worry about it. You don't think about things like ISSU and HA, which means the software that's powering these boxes is quite simple. You don't need complicated software. Now where that leads to as a third derivative of this particular property is for you to develop new apps to run on a platform is much simpler. If you had a dual soup with HA and ISSU and you as a third party wanted to develop an application to run on that box, the things that you have to take into account would be much harder than if it's just a, looks like a regular server, right? And again, a one RU box simplifies all of these things and makes it all possible. All the stuff that we are talking about, SDN, DevOps, network application, and northbound, uh, API and southbound API, all of them become much more 
amenable because you're using these simple 1RU boxes. And the thing that makes these simple 1RU boxes build a large network is the class topology. What about server attached? You've talked about failure domains. You know, how do people connect servers up? Do they attach dual servers? Do they attach single servers? What do they do? Almost all the big data centers, they just work, do single attach because they have so many racks. If a whole rack goes down, they don't particularly care. But smaller enterprise that cannot sustain the loss of a rack, they typically tend to dual attach servers. Either those dual attached servers are attached to the same, or to two switches in the same rack, or they are cross connected. And that depends on various factors, including whether some people think that the ability to roll a rack completely independently of any other rack is an important characteristic. And so they will put two switches in the rack and dual connect servers there rather than cross connect the servers across two racks. But that's another characteristic that people do. So again, server attach, dual or single, works well in this topology. I won't have the time to get into the details of that, but you know, we can take it offline if you have questions. It can be the subject of another webinar. Uh, this particular topic, when I've been in a free flow, uh, the topic goes on for like two hours and it's still not ended. So I'm sure I'll not be able to do justice to many of your questions, but uh, it's all there. What about the other question that gets asked is, so you keep saying big mega data centers, big mega data centers, does this only apply to the big guys? What about us? What if I have got a very small network, do I still care about it? Well, the answer to that depends. May, most, many of the small guys are moving to a cloud. They want to offload the work that they have to do to maintain a running network to the cloud. And if the application requirements are not layer two specific, meaning they don't use layer two multicast, they don't rely on being in the same VLAN, so to speak, then, People can take advantage of this and just run everything with layer three and be completely unshackled from proprietary layer two technologies. And many small IT shops are run by Linux and server or rather server admins who are script savvy and can so can set up these networks. And again, when we get to the next webinar, which is about how you manage these networks and how easy it is to manage them, we'll talk about how scripting makes it very easy to be done on these networks. And what about fitting existing applications? That's all great, Dinesh, but you know what? I still have got traditional applications that rely on layer two connectivity, and I still want layer two as a service. Well, the way you solve that problem is by using network virtualization technologies such as VXLAN, and you can create layer two overlays over this layer three fabric. That does two things for you. The first thing it does is it separates the virtual network from the physical network, which means that now you're agile. Everything is actually running. This is a true SDN where the virtual networks are spinning up and spinning down at the rate that customers are signing in and uh, the customers are signing off. And you can now provision these networks much more effectively. Again, what you have got is a nice, simple fabric which acts as a communication bus for your applications, whether those applications are Hadoop or Memcached or they are cloud applications which are relying on network virtualization. To me, network virtualization is no different than any other app. The fact that it has the word network in there may be why many people think that this is a problem that has to be solved in the network. So, and this network, like I said, it provides you the flexibility to run both uh, the modern applications as well as the traditional applications. So you can use the same class fabric with network virtualization to solve that problem. And in closing, the existing Access Act core design is slowly making way for class fabrics. The class layer three based fabrics are simple, scalable, flexible, and agile. And managing a class fabric, including routing and such, is the topic of the next webinar. Uh, before I conclude and uh, take more questions, you know, it's funny if uh, someone from old times walked, uh, came, was transported into the modern world, and he saw someone with a Bluetooth headset walking on the road talking to himself. He'd be like, is this guy mad? What's he just talking to himself? I think something that might look even more insane is a guy sitting in a room talking to himself and trying to push slides out. So to make me not look mad, I have a few people in the room who came by and I want to thank them for taking the time to stop by, though for many of them maybe this was old hat and they knew what was going on. I hope I did not bore you. And for the audience who was there, I hope uh, you found some measure of what is uh, interesting. Also, I uh, wanted to just put a shout out for the Cumulus Workbench. 
the workbench is a way for you to be able to go check out how Cumulus uh, works and to be able to actually put you get a hands-on experience with some Cumulus uh, networks and to try out the class topology for yourself. Uh, with that, I'm open to more questions. Awesome. We have a lot of questions actually coming in. Uh, regarding any production deployments of class based designs, which you've seen, um, have these been mostly greenfield or brownfield in place with existing three tier networks? So a lot of them have been uh, greenfield because the mega data, field data, mega data centers are building greenfield, but I've seen a lot of brown net field networks as well. And we could talk about how a brownfield deployment would happen where you have got an existing network along with a traditional class network, I mean, along with a modern class network. Great. And do you see spine leaf pods connected to each other via core or by more spines? That's an interesting question. That That is, this is again an aspect of uh, the class network that allows both of them to happen. I've seen a few network designs where people just put uh, the spines instead of interconnecting two pods with a spine, they put in actually a kind of a ring mesh uh, spine network to hook up all the pods together. But that typically they are smaller networks, they are not the large networks. Okay, great. This, this question is actually a little bit long. Um, as link speeds go up, the cost of optics become very high, especially for 40G and 100G and beyond. The more boxes we add, the more of such costly optics we need. So isn't there a profitability that A, cost goes up due to more optics, and B, reliability goes down due to more optics failures? That's a very good question uh, in the sense that actually I know of mega data centers that said we won't do 40G. We will just do 10G. They get two advantages of that. First is because 10G is more common and much more has been around for a longer time. It's much cheaper. The second benefit they get is if I've got a 40G, if I look at my oversubscription ratio, the number of ports that many of these ASICs will allow is much less. The second uh, of 40G ports. The sec therefore, the number of net, the size of the network they can build is somewhat smaller. But also because they are 40G. The number of spines you have to connect them to is much smaller because you, your old subscription otherwise goes up if you have a lot of spines, all of them connected at 40G. But if you reduce the number of spines, you lead to exactly the point that you're making, which is you reduce the fine grain failure domain. So I'm aware of certain data centers, mega data centers who said we'll just stick with 10G. But then some others have said, well, you know, the cost of 40G has come down enough for me to start doing 40G. So again, I see different people choosing different answers, and this is a topology that allows both those answers to coexist. Great. And in your opinion, how reliable is um, this software, software layer in comparison to established systems like Cisco? So yesterday, we put a tweet out saying like Cumulus is running a million ports. I presume that's a very Cumulus-specific question compared to a class question, because if it's class, it's IP. You know, it's been around forever. It powers the internet, and uh, these networks are running in the modern data centers. But if your specific question is specific to Cumulus, uh, we put out a tweet yesterday that we are now on a million ports. We run in one of the largest data centers in the world. You, you, what you're doing today, some of your traffic is probably going through our boxes, and you just don't know it. So, in terms of stability and uh, you know being in production and battle tested. I feel fairly comfortable in answering that question for the class. If you do VXLAN, how do you connect a VXLAN network in your data center out to another data center or to a cloud service like uh, AWS? Well, that's a far more detailed question than I can answer in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> but All right, then I think we are done. Um, thank you so much, everybody. We're out of time. Um, Thank you everyone for your participation. We hope you found this presentation about modern data center network architecture useful. Um, join us September 17th when Dinesh takes a deeper, deeper dive into the modern data, set, data center with prescriptive topology management. And details will be available on our website, cumulusnetworks.com slash webinars. And then join us on September 3rd. We're teaming up with Ansible to discuss automation while running Cumulus Linux. And each Thursday morning, you can also join us for a product overview and introduction to Cumulus Linux. And all details are um, available.